Oh my god. Uh -huh. You're doing great. You're doing great. I say you are. I'm always like, damn, she is really staying up on content. For yeah. real? Yeah, I'm so impressed. I Dude, mean, it's fantastic. That's crazy because I felt the la like the last year and a half, I was totally burnt out and yeah. like doing a lot less. I just started having you coming know, out of burnout. You yeah. girl, you know. Oh my god. Can we talk yeah. about burnout? Yeah. For sure. Because you experienced it <laughs> for like five years straight. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's really, um, it's real and it sucks. <sighs> it's intense. But you're coming out of it. That's great. Yeah. I know. It's, I wish it was just like black and white of being like getting a cold and then being like, okay, now you're cured. You're done. I'm healthy again. Great. When did you start making content? Are we in it right now? Yeah. We're oh, okay. <laughs> this I is how you were talking. This is how. This is how little. <laughs> Should no, I do I, it? I love no. I I <laughs> love that, but I couldn't tell if you were talking under your breath because you were still like getting your camera ready, and so I was like, are we? Or are we telling secrets? Wait, <laughs> was I whispering? No, it was a cadence that I was just like, I don't know. Did I change my cadence? No, it's me overanalyzing I gotta, everything. How do you not? The goal is to pretend that the cameras don't exist entirely. Yeah. And I think I do a good job. You did. And so then that's because like, I got fooled. So I didn't know that we did. were in it already. <laughs> that's why I was like, this is so casual. <laughs> I, but I appreciate that. Wait. Okay, now I know. Hold on. Uh, I can't. Burnout. No, when did I start making content? When did you start? I started, technically I started making content in college. I took an editing class and they had us all register YouTube accounts so that we could post our projects that we made in class and everyone could see them and share them with each other. Whoa. And I thought that YouTube was like an inter-campus like web video website that we were using. I didn't realize Whoa. like how until after, uh, after being in the class for a little bit that I'm like, oh, this is a public like uh, that's funny. platform. Yeah. So I have my very first videos, which I think are taken down now for music copyright stuff. Uh, <laughs> they were all projects and I'm like, 18, 19, 20 years old in them. What were the pro like, what was the project? Well, one, I remember making, um, it was just me lip syncing to Avril Lavigne's girlfriend and love that wearing different costumes. And I gave it to, as a gift to, um, the guy I was dating at the time. Uh, oh. cause he, yeah, I, I like learned how to make jump cuts in editing and I was like, this is so slick. This will be such a great gift for him. <laughs> and he loved it. It was great. Uh, but it's yeah. like so cringy to look back on. It's just me lip dubbing with like fake glasses on and it's, yeah. Do you have it? It got taken down because of the song. Of the song. Yeah, but, but it was a classic. Could you put it up and use Avril Lavigne sound and just like post Probably. it on TikTok? Because I think you need to do that Probably. today. Yeah, this is like 2006 or yeah. 2007. This is like way, way back. Yeah, I couldn't believe it stayed up for as long as it did. But it needs yeah, to make an appearance. Yeah, I'll consider it. I've started like. Can you look back at your content? Very hard. Same. Why Even from that? like last week, I can't. Yeah, I'm only yeah. now starting to get a little bit better, but yeah. like it makes me cringe so hard. The thought of like going back through archives and being yeah. like, let's see what I was doing. Like, what was who I was up that to? girl? Yeah. And I, I have a know. lot of mixed emotions around it. Like yeah. some of them I'm like, I like her. Yeah. Others, I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm only starting to like have some compassion and empathy, I guess, for uh, yeah. my previous self and actually look back at content a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah. Like baby steps. So, okay. So editing class, do you like editing? I used to love editing so <laughs> much. Now, huh? I used to love it too. Yeah, I, cause that's where like the video, I was go a few years at a time making five videos a week. And so just myself and I would improvise a bunch of stuff to camera and then editing is where like, oh, it actually became a thing. Yeah. Like, here's a bit that I'm doing with this like yeah. 
jump cut, rewind, slow mo, like all of the tropes. Yeah. And I used to have so much fun figuring that out. And then naturally, after years and years of doing that, just started to hate editing, mm. to hate looking at my own face. That's, I think, the worst part <laughs> that, okay. of this. I, I don't think we're meant to look at our faces no, this much. Not I a, don't like it. Because I would start to have like dissociative, like, who's this person that I'm editing? I'm me sitting here, but this person that yes. I'm looking at on screen is me. And even to this day, I still have a little bit of a like tinge of like, ooh, identity crisis, I guess, oh, yeah. when it comes to it. I'm, now, I feel like I've taken a break from heavy duty content for years and now I've just started like figuring out how to enjoy it again without pressure of yeah. the quality or quantity of the content yeah. and just like making what I want for myself right now. It's still like a process because I'm yeah. very easily triggered by like, I got to do more, I got to do better and all of that kind of stuff which I'm sure has come oh, yeah. into play for you. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like never enough where you do something that that works and you like and you're proud of, and then it's just like gone. And then you, it's, yeah. it's a hamster wheel. Endless hamster wheel. Yeah. And you can't, I realized that like I spent years never enjoying any of the positive things that yeah. came out of content creation any of the opportunities or successes that yeah. happened for me, I never stopped to consciously enjoy out of fear that yeah. it would go away and yeah. fear that if I slowed down to appreciate something, I would get lost in the shuffle and I have to keep keeping up. And totally. it's been huge to kind of now, through lots of therapy, recognize that, wow, I missed like so many years of being present with what I was doing because I was just yeah. like so wrapped up in the speed of it. The grind. Oh, yeah, because yeah. it's a job that unless you structure yourself and you create boundaries and you create timetables. What are those? I don't Bound know. Okay. I'm learning this too. Yeah. Okay. That I, my burnout wasn't like a crash and burn. It was like a slow disillusion into madness for wow. <laughs> over like wow. five years it felt like because even yeah. back in the like back in the day like in the 2015-16 time period like people yeah. just started talking about burnout we yeah. were also privileged to have and still are to be yeah. able to work in these creative spaces yeah. so the idea of suffering in that you know ideal creative space like there was no space for that to exist so there was no um yeah. capacity in me to recognize like i'm not doing well right yeah because it's like you should be grateful look yeah. what you have exactly this job that never existed before it's not like, a real job exactly like yeah. and it's a hobby that turned into a job and you should um, only ever have fun doing it and there yeah. should be no downside at all Putting your Oops. like whole life, or not necessarily your whole life, but a lot of it online for yeah. like millions of people to. Yeah, well, yeah. see, that's the thing. I have always wanted to and have struggled to figure out like my boundaries on my private life being my private life and yeah. my content being like content that is yeah. comedy first yeah and obviously recently i've put way more of my private life out there but i'm always so i was telling you this before like in awe of you being able to put your life not all of it but a lot yeah. of stuff no like there. 40 million people saw me give birth so yeah how do you feel about that <laughs> now <laughs> I'm like, whoopsie, like I, if I could go back, I don't know that I would have done it. The reason I documented my birth story, well, there are many reasons. Yeah. It was like, I was vlogging, that's yeah. what I did. And this was, I was vlogging my life and this was a big part of my life. And I also was unhealthily obsessed with birth stories. Like I've watched, you? if you, there's a birth story online, I've seen it. I've wow. seen every single one. I just loved. What do you like about that? Dude, they're just, uh, 
I don't know. It's like a horror film. I oh. like horror <laughs> films, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense because I hate horror <laughs> films. And I am like, don't. what is yeah. enjoyable about watching any of... Uh, but I, yeah. the, you, like, I like watching vlogs. I love mm-hmm. watching people. Mm-hmm. It's like a weird voyeuristic quality to like seeing how someone lives their life especially because totally when you work from home for now like 15 years sometimes you feel very isolated from the rest of humanity oh uh, yeah unless you make conscious efforts to be out there doing stuff yes so vlogging i'm like oh i get a little sneak peek into the way people are living to make sure like am i doing everything okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah okay wow so the burnout happened and then and then, like, do you feel that therapy helped you recognize that? And Yeah, I mean, I went to a bunch of different... Not a, I went to a few different therapists, and it was fine, but it didn't really work for me because I wasn't ready to even let my walls down in therapy. Yeah. Like, I had a really, really tight grip of control on... Um, like what I presented to even my therapist. Right. While at the same time feeling very, in my inner world, just like struggling, very angry, very sad, very confused, very lost, and very much like not wanting to show that. Why were you angry? I was angry that I couldn't figure out my feelings. Like I couldn't believe I was struggling with something that was such a amazing situation. Okay. And I couldn't really, like, I've only in the last couple of years have yeah. started working with a therapist that I love a lot. And I'm at a place where, like, I've been able to really open up to her and mm. actually, like, make sense of my feelings. Mm. Very incredible at repressing things <laughs> and burying things and pushing uncomfortable things to the side yeah. or compartmentalizing them. So I think my burnout was, like, I was desperately trying to compartmentalize and brush under the rug yeah. that things were not going as well and it's just natural that your creative well runs dry after years of literally every day being like here's a new idea here's a new idea here's a new idea and I just had never experienced burnout before so everything was unfamiliar so you're denying the fact that like this is even happening and And it's this new industry like yeah tv production it's like okay they they write for months and then right. they film and then they and there's just like a natural break or with a film yeah a and i hadn't even set up the right infrastructure for myself to thrive like i still was not asking for help in oh, editing yeah. in anything yes. so everything was on me and so obviously like there's only so much a person can take yes. but that fear of going offline or pivoting or like for me the hardest thing that I'm still kind of untangling and I'm writing about a lot now like I went to graduate school during the pandemic because I was like what am I doing I don't enjoy making videos I don't enjoy podcasting every time I sit down to do it I have this like dread feeling and I wasn't really like honoring or listening to that and so Mm. I, the pandemic happened and everyone I think was like, what the f- do we all do? And so I found this program um, about depth psychology and creativity. What? And I, yeah, I, I still don't fully understand what I learned for two years. <laughs> You're like, I don't know what it is still. But it was kind of when like, I went. It, my husband's also, in, he's getting his PhD at the same school. Like we both went and got uh, started in two different programs and graduated last year which is very cute. You got to gotta tell me how you met, but let's finish this first. But I, yeah. need, I need the meeting story. Uh, of it. how he and I, we met yes. through YouTube 10 oh. years ago. He was working on a program called SourceFed and I was doing Daily Grace and my own thing. And we just met through the space. He was in a, a marriage. I was in other relationships. And then... So you guys were friends. We were friends. We were just like... Kind of at that point, everyone through VidCons and diff- and playlist lives and things, everyone oh sort of knew each other in the space. Yeah. yeah. And then years and years later, uh, we hung out like once when we were both single. And then I got in a different relationship. And then that relationship ended. Why? And we were both single again. 
Why did that relationship end? <laughs> that was uh, not, a, not a good one. That was one of those where you go, mm, yeah, burnout was alive and well, and I was just raging literally against the machine of my computer. Um, okay. And so was this person I was with. We, we were like trauma bonded in a trauma little bit. Bonded. You know, that's so, those. I mean, that's how true fairy tales start. <laughs> And it crashed and burned pretty hard, pretty fast, uh, for good reason. Like, we could still see each other in a room and be like, how are you? That's good. I like that. Yeah, that like part's that. nice. Do we want to see each other in a room? Probably not, but Probably it wouldn't be, not. like, the worst. But then, um, yeah, after that relationship, mm -hmm. through deductive reasoning on social media, Elliot, my now husband, could tell I was single again and reached <laughs> out to me and was like, hello. And... Uh, yeah, we just started hanging out and then it just slowly kind of snowballed and now we're married. That's it's wild. Really crazy, really crazy. So how long were you friends before it progressed into something more? We, well, we were friends technically since right. like right. 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago, something like that. Um, but, but friends, friends? No, like acquaintances. He, okay, okay, okay. And then... Uh, he saw you were single. Saw you were single. And then we started like sl slightly dating, sort of. But I was kind of, I think, going a little crazy. <laughs> a little cray -cray. In my own like world of just being like, I don't know what I'm doing creatively. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I'm just sort of like having fun and wasn't planning on getting in another relationship like at all. Ever. And yeah, well, I was just like, I don't know how I can be like with someone right now. I'm yeah. a little all over the place. Yeah. And he just was so solid and was such like an unexpected like yeah. source of like joy and groundedness and happiness. And yeah, that was um, really wow. caught me off guard. Yeah, as like such a control freak, I feel like I always sought out relationships where I was like, I like this person, I'm gonna date, I'm gonna try to date this person. And Elliot was just like very unexpected. And I think that was kind of the best case scenario for me, that it wasn't like me being like, I'm controlling the way this happens. Totally. Yeah. It just happened. Yeah, and now we've been through so, so much together. Yeah. That, you know, a lot of people ha don't necessarily go through this quickly in their relationship, and it's really, really bonded us. How long have you been married? We've been married for a little, like a year and a few months. Wow. Yeah, but okay. we've been together for five years now at this point. Okay, wow. Yeah. Wow. Very sweet stuff. Very yeah. sweet stuff. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we both signed into these graduate courses okay. in, during the pandemic. And now he's pursuing his PhD. I stopped at my master's. But the course itself um, was a lot of covering the humanities, so a lot of different like creative practices. And it was just cool. really amazing to be in a cohort with people, different types of artists uh, and different types of people from all across the United States and some international students. Yeah. And I had just been in this bubble of YouTube and content creation for so long. It was so refreshing to be It's in... almost like your brain is slowly turning into mush. Yeah. Because you're doing the same shit every day. Yeah. And we're not like creating new cells. And these people like weren't on Instagram. And I was just like, this is so nice. This is so, like, I feel... Alive. Yeah. And I also feel like a weird internet kid infiltrating these like real artists in their like Whoa. workspaces being like so like you guys are happy <laughs> like being offline what is that like but there's no camera i How know we... and that's so the program itself there's a lot about depth psychology which is a little like heady stuff but what's the, like depth psychology depth psychology so it's like cg jung like um freud and jung are like the two fathers of like psychology and jung stuff is a lot about like the unconscious uh, that one it exists okay. that we all have that going yeah. on um and that he deals a lot with like archetypal energies that we all sort of like uh, move in and out of a lot of times and one of the things that I got really into that struck me really hard in my education was this concept of persona and this um, tendency that we have, we all have a persona, like a front facing personality that we put out to the world, even Whoa. like 
not necessarily like to the degree of being on camera, but it can be as minimal as like the way you talk to someone at the grocery store. Like you suddenly put on the person wow. that you are. And we all or have like it very but, subtle. Like even the way I asked you, whatever that first question was, yeah. you're like, are we rolling? Then I'm, I literally cadence. go, are we on? Are we like, on? Yeah. And so I started to really understand yeah. the dangerous concept of over identifying with your persona, which I think was Whoa. something I had really struggled with in my creative timeline on YouTube that you brand yourself. Right. And so you like make sense of this version of yourself that's marketable, that's sellable, that's viewable online and it's monetizable. Yeah. And in the beginning years of YouTube, we just preached over and over authenticity, authenticity. Yeah. People want to watch someone being themselves yeah. and you are yourselves, but you are this version of yourself. And I think for me, I was getting, I was growing up and growing out of the content I was making, but I was so overly identified with like this version of myself yeah. that to think, what do I like if it doesn't have to do with content? I didn't have like answers for that at one point. And that yeah. really is kind of what pushed me into this graduate program to begin with. I was like, oh. I just need to do something else, something still creative, but something different. Yeah. And then learning about persona, I was like, ding, 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 there it is for me. Like I need to, at one point I was like, I need to just strip that away completely and like just be whatever the authentic version of me is. But the reality is that it's a hybrid of that. Like the persona isn't necessarily bad. In mm. my mind, I had marked it as bad because I was just so over the internet. And so like yeah. that whole, anything associated with that was like poison. Mm. And I've become in a better relationship with how my persona suits me in the world of entertainment and how it's different than, you know, in the world of not entertainment, I guess. Yeah. Come into a much better relationship with that, which I think has now made it so much more um, peaceful for me to make content and a lot less like... Because you're not judging the persona. Yeah, and I'm not grinding behind the scenes of this mask of myself and feeling like and this is so not authentic because I don't feel like this person right now. Right. And when I was podcasting for a while doing Not Too Deep, it just got to a point where I was like, I feel like I'm just being this like caricature of yeah. myself that's not far off from who I am genuinely, yeah. but I just need a break from this. Yeah. And now... I feel that. Yeah, I feel Can like... Can we quit? <laughs> Who do we ask about that? I guess we have to make those decisions. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I feel like I just needed a second to like grow up yeah. offline from everything that I was making, especially wow. like, you know, from college on, I was putting Ooh. myself on the internet. And those are like formative brain developing, psyche developing years. And so I felt like, yeah, graduate school was a great way for me to just zoom out. I was yeah. really just in it so much that I couldn't even see what was really going on other than I felt overwhelmed all the time. Yes. And now yeah. I'm able to like see things from a different perspective, still trying to make sense of it all. Yeah. Like, how do you do what you do? <laughs> like make the amount of content that you do, stay true to yourself while making it. Like, do you have a, <laughs> he's just laughing. <laughs> Are you waiting yeah. to see what this answer is? <laughs> no, I, I, um, I don't know. I think like I, I relate to you a lot. Yeah. I did have a later start than you, Yeah. which maybe made some somewhat of a difference. Like when you were saying like, 18, 19, like that blows my mind because I was psychotic when I was 18 and 19. Yeah. Not psychotic. I was like a drug addict and like psychotic Yeah, and, yeah. and a child yeah. and like figuring it out and just, you know, I can't imagine like putting myself on camera at that age. Like I think I started probably um, making content um, around like mid twenties was when I like really started. So it's been like, yeah, a it's, that's kind of when I yeah got 
it became my job. Yeah. Like before that was just like, this is kind of fun. Maybe we'll try and get into like a, the YouTube partner program has just started. And my friend and I were making content together. We yeah. were like, let's see if we can do that. Yeah. And then I got this job at my damn channel yeah. and I was like, oh, this is unheard of to be a content creator full time. Like I was waiting yeah. tables before that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, for me, it was like not easy in the beginning, but you know, it's just yeah. fun and exciting. Yeah. And also like having a clear intention. So for me, it was like, I was always really good at making people laugh. So I was like, okay, yeah, I want to make um, millions of people laugh around the world and make a living doing it. Like that was my like affirmation. Like Hell I yeah. want to do that. And I thought when I came here at 17 from Chicago that I was going to do it through um, a sitcom or right. like film traditional so, yeah traditional yeah. Mm -hmm. that was the way you did it yeah so, or like SNL you know yeah. something like that and then I was so I was auditioning a lot and I was booking like just enough to pay the bills yeah. like bad sitcoms and commercials and weird indie films and then I started seeing people making content online and like make, make, making a living doing it I was like okay cool so I made that decision yeah. And I like posted a video a day for a year and like, that's how, and they were like horrible, but I just, the consistency though. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, it was fun. And I think because my intention was, it was just very clear. Like, yeah, I want to make people laugh. So like, let me just do that. And I remember my sponsor, cause I was like newly sober at the time when I started and she was like, I was called her and I was petrified to, to make something. Cause I had always yeah. been in like other people's stuff. So if it sucked, it's not my fault. Yeah. I didn't write it. Yeah. Like, it's not my fault. It's garbage. Yeah. But if it's my writing, like it's my fault. Yeah. So I was so scared that a people weren't going to like what I did mm -hmm. and B they worse. They weren't going to care. Like those yeah. were my two big fears. And I was just so scared, but it was to the point where I was like, wanted to drink again because I knew I, I knew I had potential. I, I knew what I wanted to do, but I, and I knew if I didn't do it, I was going to want to numb because the pain yep. of not doing the thing that I felt I was meant to do was too painful. Yep. So that, so I called her and I was freaking out and she was like, Laura, she was like very mean, <laughs> yes. but I, I needed that or yeah. I wouldn't get clean. She was like, like literally when I called her every time she'd answer the phone like this, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, oh my yeah. God. I was I like, I don't think I would drink if uh, that woman was the one keeping me in line. I wouldn't want to disappoint her. I was terrified. Yeah. I, I called, she goes, yeah. And I, I said, oh my God, is this a bad time? She goes, Laura, if it was a bad time, I would tell you it's a bad time. What's going on? <laughs> my God. And I'm like, oh my God, every time without fail. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be like, okay, actually, I just figured Shit. it out for myself. Thank you. Bye. Right. So I called her. Yeah. I said, Crystal, I'm, I'm terrified. Like, I don't know. I'm too scared to make content. Like, what if da 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 Yeah. What if it's horrible or... And she goes, Laura, you're an artist. Make art. Stay in the action and out of the results. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's awesome. Dude, that, it stuck yeah. with me. Yeah. And I still say it to this day. Whenever yeah. I'm like in my head or what are they going to think? That's about me. That's self... She goes, it's selfish of you not to. And that is controversial or whatever. Like, I don't know. But for me, it worked. Cause I was yeah. like, how self-involved too, that I want to film myself. Well, that's the, yeah, I got really, I started to really, really freak out yeah. about the narcissism of it all. <laughs> and I started to be like, who gives a shit? Every time I yes. turned on the camera, I'd be like, who cares yes who am I to think that someone cares that I'm gonna try to do my makeup like this today <laughs> who gives a shit about this uh, like yeah. the world is so much bigger than what I'm doing yeah and, but at the same time there's this tension of opposites of being like who cares mm -hmm. this is so narcissistic and mm -hmm. superficial and then there's this real desire to want to connect with people because I was a very lonely kid growing up and hugely introverted and the internet in its kind of inception when I was in high school and AOL Instant Messenger and all these things really gave me an outlet for my expression within the confines of a safe space. Wow. And so I, in the early Daily Grace days, same thing. I had a very clear intention. I just want to make people laugh. Yeah. And it developed into this audience of young women that felt like they had an older sister. And yeah. I was like, that's all I wanted growing up yeah. was like an wow. older person that was close and silly with me that like sort of kind of taught me things maybe. The audience really helped inform me because in yeah. those early stages, we data started becoming a thing, which I hated in the YouTube space. And I still to this day do not really look at Seems data easy. unless a brand is asking for it. 
Um, but that is a good business practice to consult your data and then rearrange your content accordingly. I didn't really do that, but I, I learned early on that like my audience was a certain age and a certain uh, demo and that made my intention that much more clear to yeah. be like, okay, if they see me as this older sister character, I'm going to lean into that. It didn't change what I was doing, but it just gave me clarity when I'm talking to the camera, who yeah. I'm talking to. Yeah. And I feel like over the years that just became, um, it became more unclear to me, like what I was doing and became more afraid to let them down at the same time. Mm. I think I was really holding back from being as upfront about like, I don't feel well and I don't really enjoy making content and I can't really make sense of that. Yeah. And so instead yeah. I just kept trying to make it, hoping that one day I'd wake up and everything would connect again and make sense. But the when I got diagnosed with breast cancer last summer, I was kind of up against like, do I talk about this online or do I do all of this offline and hide it from everyone? And when it's over, be like, so guess what I was just up to you guys. And I felt very compelled to share it and also saw wow. my friend and fellow content creator, Hank Green, kind of going through his own cancer experience, oddly, like right before I got diagnosed, which was bizarre and hel so helpful for wow. me of wow. like watching what he was doing. Yeah. Um, and the feedback immediately from putting that out there was so pure and unlike anything that I'd ever experienced yeah. in terms of feedback from content before that well, I felt like I had a new clarity of purpose of being like, okay, I'm going to share this because yeah. ironically, this is the easiest content I've ever made for Whoa. an audience because all I'm doing is being honest. Whoa. Like everything before I felt like Whoa. I was trying to make content to hide the fact that I was like struggling yeah. a lot behind the scenes. Yeah. And this was just like, hi, I'm struggling. And like yeah. just putting it out there was so freeing and so rewarding in the sense to be able to connect with people, albeit through the shittiest of situations, yeah. but to really like, I'm sure the feedback that you get from being so honest about your sobriety is like incredibly meaningful because that's yeah. that's a real thing. That's not like, yeah. here's a joke I'm giving to you. Like yeah. this is a real human thing. And that has kind of lit a new spark in me yeah. around content. I'm not fully yeah. there. It's so easy. I mean, like it's, it's very tricky waters because you can get pulled back in so quickly to it being this hamster wheel and it being overwhelming again. So I'm like, just dipping my toe in a little bit at this wow. point. Yeah. So, so, so you made, so when you got diagnosed and by the way, so that was yeah. just over a year ago. That was, yeah. Um, April will be the year anniversary of me going to the gynecologist for the first time and saying, there's something in this breast that doesn't feel correct to me. Do you feel that? And then from there it was like biopsy confirmation. Wow. Yeah. You had said in your video that uh, I, that I had seen when you were talking about how you discovered it, that you were, there was a part of you that wasn't going to say anything to the yeah. doctor. Like, oh, it's just uh, tissue. Like, yeah. That brushing things under Whoa. the rug, the compartmentalizing, Whoa. the literally, this Whoa. is uncomfortable. So I don't think like, it took me a while to even mention to my husband that I think I feel a lump in my breast because also I was just so ill-informed about even how to check myself for lumps. And so I was just like, this has to be just like dense breast tissue. I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know what I'm doing in that world. And yeah. I don't like literally my gynecologist did the routine checkup, felt, uh, felt around, didn't say anything. And then I literally was like, by the way, I thought I felt something like over here. Um, do you feel that? And she was like, oh, actually, yeah, I do. Here, here's a list of surgical doctors that um, you should call and go see one of them and then they'll take it from there, basically, if they find anything suspicious about it. That's wild. And it's wild that she did the exam and yeah, missed it. Totally. That's why I'm like, 
please go check yourself, touch yourself, uh, have a gynecologist check you out, especially because there's like a rising percentage of millennial women being diagnosed with breast cancer. Do you know why that is? No, there's a New York Times article that my friend Taryn Southern, who weirdly had the same diagnosis four years earlier and has been just like a huge guiding light for me in the whole wow. process of it, um, that was highlighting the fact that a lot of millennial women are being diagnosed, those numbers are going up and they can't find an exact cause. Yeah. There's a lot of suspicion around like this generation isn't having children. So the milk that we would normally use in our breasts for child for raising children yeah. isn't being utilized and there's some sort of like potential connection there. Um, but yeah, now I'm just huge and anything that you feel is uncomfortable or weird, do not be afraid to bring it up to a doctor. That's wow. literally their job. Okay. Yeah. What, uh, what do you remember? I'm sure you remember, like, what was your reaction when you found out? It was, well, it was, the whole thing was very, very surreal. It still yeah. is very surreal. Like it I still is. I, I constantly, I'm like, what the just happened? <laughs> like, did that yeah. actually just happen? Which is also why I'm thankful I kind of documented the process of it because I still have a hard time believing that all of that really just happened. Um, there were, like when I went to get my first biopsy, again, I'm a person that doesn't do any research about anything and maybe Same. should do a little bit more. Um, when I went in for my biopsy, I didn't realize how intense it would be, like okay. how invasive it would be. And everyone that was there was perfectly polite and professional, yeah. but I didn't realize how long it would take. And so I was just like there with my mask on, just staring at the ceiling uh -huh. while the doctor that came in to do my biopsy, the first thing she said to me was, oh, when I was diagnosed five years ago, it was in this same spot. So what do you do with that kind of sentence other than think I have breast cancer? Okay. And this is how she's telling me. Um, which I don't think she was doing in any way to be harmful. I think she genuinely was, without being so direct, direct. being like, look at me now. Like I had breast cancer five years ago and I'm fine. The most indirect doctor. Yeah. You're like, but wait a minute. She just speaks in <laughs> riddles. Like, I never what got are her you name. saying? I never, because I went to this imaging place and it's just the doctor that's there at this imaging place. I never told her my, well, she knew my name because of the, records but she said well, that to me and then she said you're such a calm patient which is crazy because the mask <laughs> made that possible because I was just staring at the ceiling the whole time freaking the yeah. fuck out in my mind yeah. and just trying not to freak out in that room and so that kind of made me laugh which was nice and then she asked do I want to see it the samples that they pulled out of my armpit and my breast and I was like no no ma'am I'm good I'm so good. And then I got out of that experience and my husband picked me up and I just got in the front seat of our car and cried because I was like, that was so much. And Whoa. I'm thinking maybe I have breast cancer, but we didn't know we had to wait like a week. Also that same day we drove up to go to our uh, graduate graduation. Like our, so Whoa. spent the weekend with all of these great people that I only got to see a couple times because the program itself was a hybrid program. Yeah. And just while my breast is like taped up and trying to make sure nothing's seeping through the dress I'm wearing at graduation. And then we, wow. yeah, came back and uh, had to wait a week for the results, which is insane. How was that? I don't remember at all. Like, yeah. I think I think I really just dissociated, which I'm love really that. great at doing. I it is a little bit of a superpower, isn't it? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I think I realized recently that like going to Catholic church growing up <laughs> is what gave me the superpower. It trained you. Yeah. I sat in those pews and was just like, brain, take me away. <laughs> take it's me a necessary anything. tactic for survival. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think our brain's being nice by dissociating. Same. I think it's doing me a favor. I'm like, like escapism without drinking? How nice. <laughs> this is wonderful. Uh, so that week was a little wild. 
We, but my husband was great. He tried to like plan certain things to just keep us busy. Like we went to Six Flags Love just that. to like be out of the house. How was that? Honestly, really great. You didn't get really? all sick because we're adults and not children. Well, a couple, yeah, went on like a couple rides and was like, yeah, this is really fun, but also my back hurts <laughs> and I'd like to sit down <laughs> for a second. So yeah, yeah realized my age. <laughs> but then the next day, he made an appointment for. Um, like a landscaper to come by our house because we wanted to get our landscaping fixed. And he's like, let's make this appointment this day, the day that we're supposed to go to the doctor's office in the afternoon to get the results. And this will keep us busy in the morning. Wow. And I, once you're in the Cedar sinai um, system, there's an app that you can download. And that yeah. morning I got a, an alert that said like your results are uploaded to your profile, which I just assumed a little, I sort of thought like that's just for the doctors. But then this guy came to our house and um, we're walking around our, our house and he's talking to us about which plants we could do here. I'm half there, barely half there. Yeah. And, but in the back of my mind, I'm going, I should check to see if I can actually see those results yeah. before we go to the doctor's office. Yeah. Because, yeah in my control freak way. So I was like, I can manage my emotional reaction if I find out. Right. So I, the guy wraps up with us. I go into my office and I download the results and I'm like copy and pasting the words into Google because I don't understand the medical terminology on these papers. Wow. And I'm sitting in my office and I'm copy and pasting and I, I look on Google and it is, yeah, you have breast cancer. But meanwhile, I didn't realize that the landscaper who was in our driveway, his truck broke down in our driveway. Okay. And so my husband was out trying to figure out how to get this guy's truck out of our driveway. So I have yet to tell my husband. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there being like, I have breast cancer and this man's truck and he and his wife are just standing in our driveway. <sighs> and our driveway is like on a hill. And so we called AAA and they couldn't get up our driveway to like jump his truck. So it took like an hour, hour and a half that I'm just sitting there with this information, just like trying to help my husband help this guy. And then finally he's able to get his truck out of our driveway. And we have like 10 minutes before we have to leave to go to this appointment. And I sit him down and I'm like, I have to tell you something. Um, I looked at the results on my uh, account and yeah, I think I'm pretty sure that I have breast cancer. And like, as I was saying that to him, just a huge coyote runs down our driveway. Whoa. Crazy. So Whoa. like a day of shenanigans. Yeah. Uh, and a, weirdly, the depth psychology stuff that we studied has yeah. a lot about like symbolism and like coyote is like a trickster character in that world. So for us being like little nerds about that stuff, yeah. we're like, whoa, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, so crazy, crazy day. Then we went to the doctor's office and uh, she came in and I was like, I already know. And she was like, oh, okay. Yeah, so you have triple positive breast cancer and then like explained everything to us. And it was really overwhelming, but yeah. there were a lot of signs leading up to that, that it was that I was gonna have breast cancer. So for that like week, I was kind of mentally preparing myself for that, yeah. which helped in a way, but still wild. But still wild. Yeah. And then she explained what type. Yeah, she explained positive. the type, which thankfully is one of the most treatable types of breast cancer yeah. and responds really, really well to treatment. Um, so lots of silver linings, which yeah. is really great. And uh, we got referred to this oncologist. We saw him. He was like triple positive breast cancer. This is how we treat it. Here's your plan. It was very thankfully black and white like it wasn't wow. like we're gonna try this and if that doesn't work we're gonna do that it was very much like this is known to work you're gonna do this program these treatments and we'll go from there and for a control freak that's amazing amazing well it was amazing for me because at that point thankfully i just graduated we had just gotten married like six months earlier. Whoa. Yeah, I, we did the health part of in sickness, or yeah, the sickness part of in sickness and in health first. But the, <laughs> yeah. uh, it kind of like in a weird, weird way uh, made life 
difficult and and simple at the same time that it was like this is what i'm doing this is my project this is the only thing i need to worry about and the only thing i need to care about wow yeah and really put into perspective how uh much i did not really know how to take care of myself physically that my body was always like an afterthought and Whoa. yeah which was very confronting immediately to realize like oh, this is what it really feels like when you prioritize yourself and when your health comes absolutely first above everything else. And I've never felt that before in my life and was very... Now I have this odd gratitude for the whole experience because, wow. yeah, I think about my body so much differently than I used to, which was always an afterthought. Wow, that's... That's really beautiful. Yeah, weirdly beautiful. I mean, it's not, but it is. But it is. Like, that's the weird, the whole experience. Your perception of it all is, like, incredible. I, thankfully, too, uh, the weird, like, the universe, I don't know what it was up to. What's up? Goofy. What's going on? It was being a little goofy, but also lined things up in a way for me to handle this in a way that I could not do as well at any other point in my adult life. Dude. Like I had been in therapy for years and really making a lot of progress. I stopped drinking for a really long time leading. Like I was six months sober Whoa. going into this. Okay. Yeah, just as like my own thing of being like, I need to like get back to myself. Yeah. And so a lot of things aligned for me to be like, more capable in this situation than I could have ever been any of the years prior. So it, that's partially why I felt more confident putting it out there too, is because I felt yeah. more like grounded in myself of taking Whoa. it on. Yeah. Timing is really weird. Yeah. Do you believe in like a higher power or something? I like that. I think the universe, I think there's the no way of knowing. And that's really fun. Yeah. Like, I think, and the depth psychological stuff really plays into this idea of like myth and metaphor being these kind of um, ways in which we relate to our psyche and the cosmos as a whole and ourselves within the cosmos. So it's a bit trippy, but like, I love tarot cards, I love astrology, I love all that stuff because Whoa. I think it's fun. I think it's a much more fun way to think about um, the, the world and yourself in it. Like I grew up Catholic, but that was pretty abandoned after I received all the sacraments and my family never really, um, we all kind of grew out of the Catholic faith. Did you have siblings? Yeah, yeah. And none of us are very religious in our adult lives. So this is like spirituality, I guess, is as close as I get to that. So yeah, I think there's some goofy shenanigans going on that like I can't coyote. account for. Right. And then the coyote. Explain that. I know. And then the coyote, like months later when I was finished with chemo and I actually like walked on a treadmill for the first time, like did any form of exercise yeah. for the first time in like seven months. Uh -huh. I was standing in my living room vlogging about it and same exact spot, a coyote came running down as I'm talking about like my treatment is done and I am now getting to do exercise. Like it was a very weird bookend thing that I was like, that's fun. That's very fun. It's fun. Yeah. There's something very goofy about it. Um, and it's like, you're right. We don't know. So why not choose the fun thing? Yeah. Because yeah. we don't know. But also, I respect if someone doesn't want to choose that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm free to choose, so are you. Go ahead. Yeah, like, I respect if you don't like fun. Yeah. No, if you I'm don't like fun, <laughs> totally fine by me. It's fine by me. Yeah, are you in that world of... Yeah, so, like, I grew up atheist. I grew up atheist. Oh, yeah. Wow. My dad, we were the only athe atheist in town in a very catholic neighborhood yeah and i was the only my dad was staunch atheist and like organized religion is shit. Laura's yeah. 
Eat a hot dog, you're too skinny. I wish I had your dad when I was in CCD <laughs> having to learn about, I'm like, I don't, if this guy doesn't think mm-hmm. that gay people are okay, I don't know if I like this guy. Isn't that funny? It's yeah. not, it's not, it's yeah. not. My best friend's gay, he grew up Catholic, and then he has two, he's got a three out of four of them are gay, and they just had yeah, to my like little brother's gay. the Catholic religion at my that little, point. I know. What are we doing here? My little brother's gay, and my parents are divorced, so we would go to church and they couldn't receive the sacrament and I'd always be like why do you guys have to sit out and my mom would be like because they don't recognize like divorce and I was like that seems contradictory (laughs) to this idea that Jesus loves like everyone except (laughs) divorced people but so you grew up atheist Yeah, yeah so I grew up atheist and then it was when I got sober part of a recovery program there's like um a higher power aspect to it it's not religious but right, it's spiritual yeah. Yeah. and so there's like prayer and meditation involved and in like part of your recovery process yeah and so that tripped me out and actually stopped me from getting sober at the beginning because i'd hear the word god and they were like but it's a god of your own understanding god could be for me well god could be anything it could be the sun mother yeah. nature love the power of life itself whatever it is that resonates with you, it's just a power greater than you. Yeah. And so that I could wrap my head around because it was accepting of everyone. And I was like, that's cool. So then I started praying and meditating and yeah, it's like, I would say I believe in a higher power, but my perception of a higher power changes all the time. And I I like, like you, it's like, I don't know exactly what that is because how can you, we're not really meant to know, but I'd rather live my life believing in a higher power and then finding out there isn't one than then live my life believing there isn't and then finding out there is like yeah. again it's like more fun yeah it's <laughs> and, more fun dude and there's been like so many um like god shots um they call it in the program have you heard of that it's mm-hmm. kind of like the coyote it's just like, like synchronicities yes and stuff. yeah that that's just, in depth psychology the idea of synchronicities is huge synchronicities yeah. that's mm-hmm. it and i've just seen so many through the years and it's been just mind-blowing in a way like one example was a year and a half ago and i've talked about this before but it was like when everything went down with my ex and i and like mm-hmm. it was a really scary time we had rented out this house to this production company for two days. So we were staying in Malibu for two days um, while they were filming. And like, basically it had become really unsafe. He kind of lost it um, with the kids and he had like threatened um, suicide, not Mm -hmm. to get heavy, but that's what happened. And then like left to basically say like, this is what I'm going to do now. And like, I'm like with these, my two toddlers, like, Sorry. Yeah. No, I, um, yeah, that's yeah. intense. But so like I called my sponsor because she was like the only one who knew like what. And she I, was like, why are you calling me? Laura? <laughs> she's, like, she's like, what? Yeah. Laura? And you're like, this is a big one. This is a big one, ma'am. I'm going to need you to be nice to me because this is a big one I got for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. No, I actually had gotten a new sponsor. <laughs> Because, like, that was the first one, the yeah one, was literally, like, when I was newly sober 12 years ago and I needed, like, a drill sergeant or else I wasn't going to listen. This one's, like, kind and gentle. Okay, good. Sweet and loving. Much better suited for this situation. (laughs) I kind of wish it was the other one just for, like, the comedic story. But, yeah, so literally I call her and she, like, lives in the valley, whatever. I call her and I'm like, I I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know how to handle this. Like, this is what's happening. It's right now. She goes, where are you? I said, Mm -hmm. I'm in Malibu. She goes, where exactly? I give her the address. She goes, I'm two doors down. I'll be right there. Wow. Like what? Two doors down? Two doors down. She just walked two doors down. She was at a place. And you had no idea she was in there. I had no idea. I had no idea she was there. Like, uh, because she has a house in in Encino. Like, I didn't. But it's like stuff like that. And she was right there, like holding my hand while I called the police and like, was helping me with the kids and like just like I couldn't have done that day without her yeah and you know what I'm saying well yeah. maybe I could have maybe I could have but still I mean yeah. it's amazing it's that just, that worked out the way it did there's you know, some yeah that, like, that's like it's I mean it's it's not as fun to deny that there could be some like important <laughs> things going on that you can't understand that yeah. align that in a way that helped 
the situation. Yeah, just like odd things that, yeah, what do you call it? Synchronicities. Synchronicities. And it's a real, like, a, there's a lot of, like, like I, I, everyone, when I was telling them I was going to graduate school, they're like, are you gonna be a therapist? And I was like, mm, no, it's not a program like that. It's, and I don't wanna reduce it to this, but it was similar to like going to this art camp for adults for like two years. It was very cool, but wow. a lot of the, depth psychological stuff and like this one guy that I really like James Hillman uh -huh. he talks a lot about the concept of soul and um that it's like a way of looking at the world versus like a tangible thing itself and that the it's like a more poetic way of looking at the world where you're you're paying attention to these signs and these synchronicities and these yeah. symbols and yeah. these connections that um you would otherwise miss, but they bring a lot more meaning into your life when you're attuned to them. Um, and, and that's soul. Yeah, it's... that's, I mean, one of his definitions of soul. And of a lot of soul. A lot of modern psychology, Whoa. he kind of argues that a lot of modern psychology lacks soul. Like it's very much like, let's get to the root of this problem, which is super helpful. But um, there is like this t soul element that I don't know, really resonated with me, especially because in my creative practice, I felt like that's what was missing, like the soul behind what I was doing. Like I was just grinding. Okay. And so it just enlivens and enriches all of your relationships and sort of just when you connect to that idea. Like he wrote the book, The Soul's Code, that was like at one point in like every airport bookstore. And it's about like the, he's got this thing called acorn theory in there okay. where, um, this theory that all of us have this like innate destiny in us from when we were younger the same way an egg corn is destined to become an oak tree and there are signs of your destiny that show up throughout your youth so it's like a more positive way of looking at your childhood of being like I'm sure if you looked and you mined your childhood there would be lots of moments of comedy perhaps entertainment yeah. sort of things that aligned with the destiny that you've sort of walked into in your adult life Whoa. um and yeah just like a That's fun cool. way to look yeah because i was feeling very lost in my purpose yeah, yeah and yeah. that kind of really helped me start reflecting on like looking back for evidence of like where have i been meant to be as an adult um, and did you find it when you looked back? Yeah, I found like little things that really were yeah. like illuminating and helpful to me. Like what was one thing? Like I always say that I was a very, very shy child, which I was, but I would, there are these opportunities that I was taking when I was younger to perform like at family functions yeah. and like getting like a clown costume <laughs> and a magic set and like performing at my cousin's birthday parties and stuff like that, that I forget about that were like really meaningful to uh, me in different ways. It's just so odd. It's odd. I don't even know what to make of is it. Is it odd or is it God? Is it odd or is it God? <laughs> that's some merch. <laughs> See you, Ray. That's the merch. That's merch. And that's merch. <laughs> and we'll monetize that real quick. <laughs> Write that down. Tweet that. What is it? X that? Whatever. Oh, no, yeah. I'm not on that. I can't keep up. Me either. I can't keep up. That one has fallen by the wayside. And like, no, what's the Instagram version of that? Threads. I can't. I forget that that's there. It, I'll, every day I forget. That, and I haven't used Facebook in like a good 10 years. So that's one that I am thankful. Well, you're thankful. not a great grandmother. Yeah, that's true. But you can monetize videos on there. See, I, yeah, the business side of that, I've never really like understood that well. Well, you can hire someone to manage it so you never have to look at it. They can take all your videos, upload yeah. them, manage your page, and it could just be income that you have nothing to do with. See, that makes sense. I can And then that's where people. I hit the wall where I go, finding someone else? <laughs> hmm, I guess that's a no for me. <laughs> Because of the control, you need to... Oh, just the effort and the... Effort to find someone else to do the work. Well, also, I'm at the point where I'm like, what do I want to set up? Do I want to be, like, getting myself in the rhythm of doing content again? It's kind of like seeing an ex, in a way. That Whoa. There's, like, coming back and being like, ooh, am I strong enough to put myself back in this relationship? I don't know yet. 
Maybe eventually, but for right now, I think I need to like reduce the expectations of like uh, financial dividends from it. Easier yeah. said than done, by no, the way, yeah. as I'm sitting here being like, you should monetize that funny thing you yeah. just said. <laughs> well, cause that's the thing too. Like I was just telling you like we, well, we have to, to some degree. Yeah. Got to pay those bills. Do you have a plan? Dude. No, of course I don't. Of course okay. I don't. That's so nice My to hear. My plan is to have a hype house when we're 80 and make content in one retirement home. Wow. Think about it, Grace. Yeah. Think about it. Well, that's like the, what's that place in Florida that everyone that's moves to? It's that. that has the documentary about it because oh. it's so incestuous there. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. But that, that's what I want. Yeah. That's what is it called? The Villages or something like that down in Florida. And it's this notorious retirement uh, facility that people party like crazy. That's hysterical. No, yeah. I don't have a plan, but it's like, I do. And I go back and forth. Cause I'm like, I could see myself doing this at 80. Like I'm only going to get funnier. And like yeah. the ideas of like incontinence, like that's very funny. <laughs> yeah. And like just doing that. But no, I mean, no, I don't really. I mean, I... That's really nice because I don't either. And I feel constantly like maybe I should have a plan. And then uh, and then it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, at least right now. That's the other thing too. I Like in talking about the spirituality stuff, yeah. I have this archetype deck, this fun deck of cards Ooh. that uh, is what I use them. I should have. It's what I use for guidance. And the other day I was getting all stressed out about like not having a plan. And I pulled a card called the empty room. And it's all about being able to sit in an empty room and not fill it all up with stuff right away. And that answers are actually found in the uncomfortable patience of being in this empty space for a little bit. So I was like, oh. boom, that's all the guidance I need to chill out and just like enjoy or figure out enjoying this weird liminal space that I feel like I'm in right now. Wow. Because it's, it's actually all okay. It's all and fine. You, and you don't need to know. But there's that constant like embedded old conditioning of like, you gotta keep up or you're going to get pushed out of this space. Of what? Right. Bro? Right. Of what? See, you should be my sponsor that I just call <laughs> up. <laughs> what? I can be your sponsor if yeah. you want. Okay. Would that be the worst idea? I will answer the phone. Yeah, <laughs> I will. Yeah. That would be helpful. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. How do you, um, okay, so like right now you're just like okay with the not knowing. I'm trying to be, because that's the thing, a big thing that I work on in my own therapy is that I am so um, like accomplishment based as yeah. like my system of value that like I f won't that like about? me if I'm not successful. I won't. Right? Yeah. So that's- uh, Absolutely not. <laughs> my entire life has been like, I need to have validating successful things for people to be, to not abandon me. Is that some millennial shit? Probably, I don't know. Cause maybe. I feel like a lot of my millennial friends have that too. Like needing well, to like work really hard well, all the time. Like why the can't other, we? The other crazy thing when you like, cause I, I don't drink as much anymore and I smoke a lot of weed now, which is very nice, but <laughs> it'll make nice. you, it'll really make you think about the world at yeah. large. And I constantly think about now just how the millennial generation has been so confronted with internet and technology and being able to now see what everyone is doing. We are yeah. so overloaded with like data and information yes. about the way in which everyone at least presents the way that they live their life, which obviously takes its toll on the comparativeness of just being like, I'm not having as cool of a life as this person or this person or this person. And like, again, it comes down to you putting up your boundaries with social media, which yeah. was something I, that really contributed to years of burnout was that I didn't even realize how overly like fixated I was on social media, thinking that I wasn't and other people were. And wow, I was like, yeah. no, the call's coming from inside the house. Yeah. Like yeah. I need to reassess the way that I use this stuff. Um, because it all is like, 
I, at first I thought all social media was evil and to a degree it's difficult, but it is, you know, user by user experience and yeah. it's me determining my relationship with it. But and still, the, and the intention behind it, like if I just, right. if I mindlessly scroll, it's a toss, it's a, a coin toss. It yeah. could be like fun and inspiring yes. and I feel good and connected or I just feel ugly, not enough, yeah. like whatever, like you said, comparing and despairing yep. and it's horrible. Ooh. And I'm like, that was horrible. And yeah. I put my phone down. <laughs> it's like, that was horrible. Yeah. It's just Pandora's know? box. But I think the millennial generation were like the first ones yeah. that have been this hybrid of knowing life without this and then Jeez. in our formative years wow. being confronted with all of the information in the whole universe uh, at our fingertips at all times like, like no wonder we all have anxiety like, like gen z was fucked from the beginning but yeah. we weren't we know at least a time before, <laughs> you know, and maybe that's worse. I don't know if that's better or worse Whoa. to think about. We used to like go to the movies, oh, when was that? like untethered, just like completely without any resources other than like calling 1-800-COLLECT and trying to leave a message before they charge you. Literally. It's crazy. Yes. yes. It was so simple. So I always think like, there's going to be, I mean, in the world of psychology, all the research that they're doing, it's going to be so constantly fascinating to see what kind of toll for better or worse it yeah. takes on our generation as we grow up. Yeah. Like, I think we even see it now in the way that people are having less children. Right. And leading less traditional kind of lives than our parents had led. Yeah. And what does that lead to? Gen Z is going to have, I think, a totally different world view and experience yeah. than we do but it also like it just is the way it is like there's no stopping it so right. it's like like you said it's really imperative to just create the boundaries so if i go on yeah. social media let me go on with an intention yeah and the intention could be whatever it is like i don't know if you looked at other women who were going through a specific thing the specific thing that you were and if that was helpful for you because i know yeah. like your videos have been probably extremely helpful for so many women that feedback is the most valuable to me. Like I said, this kind of content of being able to kind of document this journey for lack of like a less cringy word yeah. has felt so humanizing to myself and to like an audience that the, the amount of support and overwhelming kind of um, attention that I was getting from people just so ready, willing, and able to help me in any way possible when yeah. I announced my diagnosis wow. was so unbelievable that yeah. of course you kick into a mode of like, I got to pay this forward somehow. Yeah. And being able to just sort of show the parts of the experience and have people resonate with that, that have yeah. autoimmune disorders or are chronically sick, not necessarily diagnosed with breast cancer or people that had siblings or family members or friends diagnosed that they didn't get a lot of information from that person about what their experience was mm -hmm. and seeing what I went through it helps them kind of understand and have more compassion for their family member or whoever it is. Yes. That's yeah. been the most kind of valuable thing wow. and feels a lot more pure than trying to make like a viral video, which is what you get ingrained yeah. to do when you make internet content sure. as a content creator. So it's really put in perspective to me, like what I value and yeah. like, I get like what you're saying about having a clear intention for everything is so true. And I think that's, what's developing for me is figuring out what my clear intention is. Yeah. And the anxiety arises when we're lost with our intention or yeah. purpose and, and, and that, that is ever changing too. Yeah. Right. Because I, I think like for me, like initially, yeah, it was just to make people laugh and I kind of missed that. And then I was like, Oh, I want to be like real and raw and like talk about the hardest things I'm going through. Yeah. And it's like, there's pros and cons to that. It's not always the most fun work. Yeah you know, yeah, yeah. but it, it can be gratifying too. So it's really, I think our purpose can be ever changing. Totally. And I know? think that's what contributed a lot to my burnout was like not letting myself graduate beyond yeah. my initial intention online and feeling like yeah. 
I can't, I don't know how to move out of this without yeah. like trying to burn everything down in the process. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, like you're saying, like intentions can, uh, evolve and it's just giving yourself that permission. That permission and that space to like figure out what that is. Like yeah. sit in that empty room and figure out what do I want? Like, what is this next phase of my life? What's going to feel Grat mm -hmm. gratifying, purposeful. Yeah. What is it? Yeah, because I, I, when balance. I. Balance. Balance? I thought you said violence for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> violence. It will be violence. violence, will be my next chapter. <laughs> Just imagine. I did. I did like, say that. All right. Okay. I did say that, Grace. Where, what is that sponsor's <laughs> number? Should we call her? Uh, yeah, but that, I mean, I love what you're saying about just the clarity of intention because that yeah. really is what it comes down to. Yeah. And I think that when you find creators that you like, you can see that they have a clear, like, purpose for what they're doing. And yes. there's something authentic about, authentic. like, their enthusiasm. Persona? Yeah, maybe their persona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kind of, like your persona can be authentic. That's the thing I learned. I was so, like I said, I yeah. thought it was this mask that like yeah. this caricature and the reality is the persona is a part of you and it will always be a part of you. It's just to what degree that you allow it to be part of you. And I think for a while I was just like, I'm my persona, I have to be, that's who I am and uh, growing out of that was just so uncomfortable that it was like, of course there's denial, but also my therapist is, I was, forgot to say this earlier. When I talked to her about the narcissism of oh, it all, yeah, she was like, Grace, there is healthy nar narcissism. There's healthy narcissism. Are you, a are you a healthy narcissist? I think I want to get to that because she's <laughs> yeah. like, you're too hard on yourself. Yeah, like you're I not a narcissist. I, but I'm so aware of that quality in the work that we do. Totally. And for her to kind of, again, give that permission for Whoa. a healthy version of that was Whoa. like, that is so much more helpful to see. I have a tendency to be very black and white in my thinking. Yeah. And that's why I'm trying to exist more in gray areas. Wow. And uh, it has been so freeing because obviously you can't be an entertainer without some level of narcissism. Like you can't yeah. want people to look at you, but tell them all to look away. <laughs> you yeah, know? it's true. And so it's true. being able to kind of reframe that, I think the healthy narcissism comes as a byproduct of having a clear intention for what you're doing creatively. Yeah. And maybe that intention isn't necessarily selfish it's like whatever the thing if you like baking and you're really yeah. good at it and you want to share like how you make this thing it's yeah. like that's you could call it narcissistic to think oh, well i'm the best baker or, or not the best but yeah. like i want to show myself or it's like it's almost what helped me get through the fact because i felt narcissistic especially yeah. at the beginning i was like jesus like oh i want to i think i'm so great and yeah. i'm gonna film myself and it was like shifting the mindset and for me someone who like untreated can be selfish and self-seeking and all of those things or narcissistic shifting it to a service mindset. So it's like, mm. okay, that was a huge one for me. So it was like, I found that when I was getting really sad or really anxious, I was thinking about what I can get. Yeah. And when I was feeling more at peace or like purposeful, I was thinking about what I can give. And sometimes that doesn't come naturally to me. Yeah. And so I had to consciously in the morning pray to a God that I don't understand and say, uh, God, um, what, uh, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? Where, or no, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? Like sort of ask mm. the question about like where to go. And then um, what can I give today rather than what can I get? Yeah. That was huge. Yeah. And so it's, it's focusing on what can I give? And then even applying that to your videos or whatever, it's like, what can I give rather than it's not about the results. It's not about the views. It's not about the laughs. It's not about the money. Yeah. It's not about how good I look. Yeah. That doesn't f***ing matter. Yeah. But when I think about the flaws or the performance, I'm not happy. 
Yeah. <laughs> but when I think about what I can give or like whatever, yeah. it's just somehow. It's, yeah, I, it, it seems dude. so like cliche, but it's cliche for a reason because it's true. The I same know. with like, I've been working on the gratitude thing of like it's trying so to. so cliche, Chris. But I feel like. In baseball. I know, but it's working. And I do think it contributed to me <sighs> having an easier time in my treatment. Like dude. so many dude. nurses and doctors throughout the process were like, your attitude is amazing. And we can't say that enough to our patients without, you know, seeming yeah. you know, judgmental or something. Yeah. How much having some semblance of a positive attitude reflects in like the physical healing process. Oh. And it, I was just like, oh, they're being nice. They're being nice. But reflecting on like the whole last year, I'm like, I really think that trying to look for the good in an objectively shitty situation helped out more than I know. How did you get to that point? Part of it was the responsibility I felt after putting it out there to an audience. That Whoa. I, uh. And I, I didn't want to be like, I'm putting this out there so that I have accountability to try and be upbeat. Because I... I allowed myself to experience all of my emotions, which again, going back to like how I used to be, I never let myself experience my emotions because they were too overwhelming because I couldn't understand them or like trust that I could oh handle God. them. So obviously heavy drinking, push things under the rug, all of that kind of stuff swells up. Did like you you're saying. Do you want to be an example to your little sister? Yeah. Yeah, oh my God. in a yes. partially. It wasn't the entire like. Obviously, a I wanted part to. Of it. I wanted to survive my treatment, <laughs> but I also was like, again, the choice of looking at the world poetically versus not. Whoa! It's more fun for me to endure this situation if sometimes I'm having a good time. Like my husband and I were able to like make jokes throughout the process Stop. that were so helpful like there's a reason i got into comedy in the first place it was yeah. like an incredibly healing um way of presenting myself in the world and way of connecting with people like oh, yeah. i default to it you know as a coping mechanism in yes. a lot of regards but in this sense yes. it was so and you're good at it you have a funny brain you too it's Thank the you. and it just feels way more fun you know, then yes. not trying to do that. Especially in like that setting. Yeah. It also, it's like well, it's the also, juxtaposition. And the people pleasing part of me, yeah. even though I wasn't making content, still would be like, I want the nurses to like me. I'm going to be the <laughs> cutest, funniest patient they've ever had. Watch this. I'm about to make a lull right now. And it'd be like, I sort of, yeah, yeah. it was the positive yeah. momentum of all of it. But it, like, it fuels itself because even though like i'm i'm like trying to be funny by doing that it was bringing me joy yeah. and it was making me feel better in a situation that is really easy to just let yourself feel like absolute garbage every single day Whoa. so and there were days where i felt like absolute garbage all day long and i let myself have those days too would you say the process of documenting the experience made it not easier, but gave you strength. Yeah, definitely gave me strength. And it definitely helped me process it because it yes. was so surreal. I have no experience with cancer in my family at all. I have wow. no experience with even someone being um, in the hospital. Like I, I'm, I'm very sheltered in that regard, very privileged like medically in a lot of ways. Whoa. So this was the first time to be confronted with the entire healthcare system and thankfully we had a decent time I think it and you was finished you rang the finish bell. yeah I'm in remission now and it went like really as well as it could in a lot of ways um there's also now this weird sense of like survivor's guilt that comes along but I'm trying to stay Whoa. like connected to the gratitude okay. of everything but also just learn to experience all of my feelings in it and I think documenting it really helped me t 
talk through what was going on that was so unbelievable when I, if I just sat by myself and was thinking in my head of what was happening, yeah. it was so overwhelming and so surreal that I kept thinking it was like a dream I was going to wake up from yeah. and being able to actually share it and also like hear the feedback of people that were going through the same exact thing as me yeah. at the same time, you know, that ability to connect like that and to feel like you're not alone in an otherwise yeah. unbelievable situation is so helpful. It's so grounding. It is just to sit there and whatever you're going through, be able yeah. to like watch other people going through it. it. Yeah. That feeling of not being alone is incredible. Yeah. And that's where like the social media has benefits. You yeah. Know? Isn't it's just being evil. intentional with, yeah. with it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was a lot of feeling like, um, like it really grounded me and was as much as an audience thought it was helpful for me to put that content out there. It was selfishly helpful to me to yeah. like hear feedback from everyone of like their own experiences and to be able yes. to like yes. commiserate about different um, parts of it that are very bizarre and unique and strange and scary. So what? it was, yeah, very, very helpful in a lot of ways on both parts, I think. How do you think, I feel like you kind of answered this, but how did this experience change you as a person? I'm still finding that out because yeah. I'm in now this weird phase where I think I'm going to have a lot of, and I'm starting to have a lot of medical whiplash of that, oh, shit, what the fuck just happened? Whoa. Like our lives really changed overnight. And like I said, they became, this is what we're doing now. And we're doing doctor's appointments and we're doing uh, this. We're not doing, let me figure out what I can come up with creatively. Um, so it was a lot of putting my head down mm -hmm. and moving through the process, which now that my head can come out of the sand yeah. is a little bit of like, whoa, that was really scary. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of, even my oncologist and a lot of comments that I've read are like, be really gentle to yourself after treatment is done because the feelings are all just below the surface. Like it's, wow. there's a lot of stuff that comes up that you, and I think will continue to come up. So I'm still in a process of feeling like, yeah. um, what is the transformation going to be like? I don't know. But like I said, I'm in a much more graceful relationship with my body, yeah. which before I was like binge drinking and just like eating like it and like really mm. treating my body poorly, um, with no like cognizance of how to take care of myself. Like the understanding of like, mm. you know, self care and all of that, but never putting it into actual practice. And this was like a matter of life and death that I had to put it into practice. And wow. so in a funny way, like thank you universe for like right. uh, helping me in the most up way possible but I, is like you will literally take care of yourself that's what i feel like i feel like they it did shake me by the shoulders yeah. and was like stop it <laughs> like yeah calm down you sit down on that couch and you think about your body and that's what we're gonna right. make you do yeah and it worked like i do feel worked. like yeah i'm Whoa. in a new relationship but it's wow. it's gonna be evolving this is gonna be a year of a lot of transition and growth, I think, but letting myself just like sit and let it happen versus like rushing to figure it all out right now. Wow. Yeah. That's really beautiful and profound. I, uh, I, tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> I'll be back on the wagon, just drinking like crazy and being like, I don't know what I'm doing again. Tomorrow. <laughs> Who knows? Can I pull up some questions from people? Yeah, of course. I've not vetted these. So. Perfect. <laughs> oh, perfect. Excellent. I can't wait. <laughs> um, did Okay, Subtle Sydney says, did Goose know something was wrong during your treatment? Also, I love her. Oh, my dog, yeah. Four minutes, oh God, go, come on. <laughs> yeah, come she on. was really sweet. No, weirdly, like they, <laughs> like they say the dogs have six senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she really did. She was like uh, next to me like every day to the point now that I think the, she has 
even greater separation anxiety. So I don't know that the byproduct really helped her, um, but it really helped me. <laughs> that, yeah, she was very, very sweet and very much could tell that like something was up and was very gentle. And like extra lovey dovey. Extra lovey, yeah. Like it made me cry multiple times throughout the process of just being like, damn, animals are really great. Yeah. Did you cry a lot? Yeah, I did. And do, which is great for me. Because you don't normally cry? I, well, I, in the past, like I said, my feelings would bottle up to a point that they would be explosive the way they come out, either in anger or in sadness. Like, so big yelling, big tears. And throughout the process, I was really able to just let myself literally feel everything as it came up. So there'd be days where I would just like cry like once an hour but I feel great after I cried and wow. then ultimately I feel like again. And it was just like, oh, this is what it's like to experience your feelings in real time rather than push them down until they explode uncontrollably. And you couldn't drink? Couldn't drink, which was great that I had taken like months of not drinking right. before because yeah, yeah, yeah. honestly, I think if I had to quit cold turkey because of this, it would have been a really challenging situation emotionally because oh, yeah. I was really detangling myself from a lot of the shit that fueled my drinking for months leading up to this that helped me be in a space that was I think much more level-headed going into something that was like out of my control yeah yeah oh yeah yeah the timing I know weird weird really weird weird or is it god odd or is it god <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. What's it like to be so freaking awesome? That's very kind. Um, Just want to make you uncomfortable. Yeah, because I, I, I know what to do with that. I don't know what to do with that kind of comment. <laughs> that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Again, it comes back to like if I acknowledge that, that's narcissistic. You're a narcissistic whore. Right. Uh, and if I say I wouldn't know because I'm not, then that's cruel to myself uh -huh. too. Uh -huh. um, it uh, feels uncomfortable. <laughs> Being <laughs> awesome feels uncomfortable. <laughs> to be so freaking awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's complex. Yeah. Okay. I People are like, no. idiot. It's like, no, okay. nobody thinks, like, they just have such low expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also crazy because Hank Green, literally the science guy on YouTube okay. and TikTok, got diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma but like two months before my diagnosis and was able was out there being exactly himself explaining the yeah. science behind it yeah. and i was like "Ooh, i can't do that yeah, unfortunately no. at all <laughs> so instead i'll talk about my feelings through this journey <laughs> it's much more relatable yeah it's well, whatever I do know. It's, it's just utilizing your strength I yeah guess. it's what i did know throughout the process right and yeah. i feel like you you've gotten more in touch with your feelings and able yeah. to express them and feel them. I got to work on that, dude. You're inspiring me. That's great. You're it's inspiring me. Constant work in progress. Honestly, like I was, I have been in therapy with this therapist for like three or four years okay. now. Up with the number. Only in, like, but it wasn't until year two or three that like, I feel like I finally let my walls down and was like, now this is connecting for me. Now I'm getting it. Now I'm making some traction and this, is really, really helpful. But before all of that, I was just like going through the motions of like, I'm doing therapy, but. Making jokes. Yeah, like talking, controlling everything I'm saying to her rather than, and like hearing myself talk to her and being like, you're not telling her the whole story. What's up? Why are you even paying for this right now? Cause but, we're really masters at dissociating. Yeah. I, I say we, cause we're one. <laughs> <laughs> we're different people, but like, I identify. We're so similar. Yeah, I really That's identify. That's I'm like, tell me, I feel like I've talked too much and I no. just want to hear everything going no. on in your brain about everything you're doing yeah. and the way you exist in the world. <laughs> because we I'm can, like, yeah. I want to be better friends with Laura because I feel like we have so much in yeah, common. We, it's we crazy. Do, we do. We yeah. do, and we will, and I'll tell you everything. You, you just live know. on the other side of the universe from me Dude. in this what's damn the, town. What's the halfway? Let's do a halfway yeah. lunch. That sounds great. Do you ever go on halfway? 
No, is that an actual thing? <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah, it, it tells you literally halfway. Dude, yes. It tells you like cafes and restaurants like that. It's exactly what? halfway. Yeah, you put in either the town you live in or like your address and their address and it gives you exactly the halfway mark. That's amazing. Yes, yeah, we'll have to do that for sure. You always want to know like what's the halfway. Yeah, right? 100%. Right? Genius. Great. I know. Done and done. Um, okay, wait, there's a, just a few more questions and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I also wrote a stupid sketch. It's like one minute you could read it and hate it and don't want to do it and that's fine. I wouldn't ever be offended. Okay. What time is it? It's 12.10. What time I is have to leave by like 12.30. 30? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think we could knock or it out. Or 12.40. If it's literally called the... Wor wait. Worst things to say to someone with cancer. Excellent. Do you like Love that? It. Love it. Let me text it to you and see if you like it. Great. Um, all right. We're just, we're rolling. Look at this. This is fucking happening. <laughs> but you know what's cool is what I'll do is I'll like film a podcast and then I'll do like a little conversation sketch like here because the cameras are set up. Yeah. And it's just great. like an easy transition. This is, you know how to run your business. Sort of, kind of. But this is what I need to be around now. Sort of, kind of. Like, this is a very inspiring to me. Will you this, come back and just 100%. hang out? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Can I just be an intern for a day and take <laughs> notes on how you run your system? I would love that because I actually don't know what I'm doing. I don't think you ever know. You're doing whatever you're doing really well. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> like, I'm like my own worst critic. So Sorry, all. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. L what makes you laugh the hardest? Stupid things. <laughs> dumb, 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 stupid, mm -hmm. stupid things. Um, I love high camp kind of stuff. Like, mm. I just saw The Devil Wears Prada for the first time. Never seen it. Last week. Yeah. Okay. Do well, I need to? <laughs> you should because it's so silly. It's like high camp as really? a movie. Especially when you think about how culturally iconic yeah. it was yeah. at the time that it was released. Yeah. Um, I was laughing hysterically through that whole thing because yeah. it's just high camp, but okay. really dumb, silly stuff. Like grew up watching Monty Python and mm. that kind of thing. So yeah. the dumber, the better for me. I love dumb. Yeah. Absolutely love it. I like a bit of highbrow too. Oh, that's clever, but love the dumb love shit. Dumb shit. Love, love dumb, dumb shit. So I feel like the much. 90s got dumb shit really well with like yeah. adam sandler chris farley like that they were super dumb very dumb michael myers very dumb men. all that very <laughs> very stupid, dumb men stupid, 90s dumb. full of dumb men <laughs> making dumb comedies yeah you know but like the way adam sandler continues to carry himself in the world just without trying i find hysterical like the way he dresses constantly i'm just like this is great like that's stupid totally <laughs> and he doesn't realize it because he's so dumb yeah Oh man, I love that. Um, okay. Okay. What, what's one good thing that happened because of cancer? I learned to let myself rest. This is from Jackie Ham. Yeah. I feel like we, um, you have meant, have talked about this a little Ooh. bit throughout this, but yeah, I've learned to let myself rest. Yeah. Like truly making my health a priority. Yeah. Like I can't say that enough Whoa. how that wasn't a priority for me. And I was just privileged enough to not have any sort of situation in which my health was compromised to a degree that I had to make major lifestyle changes wow. until this happened. And to be able to wake up feeling like it, but then go, the only thing I need to do today is sit on the couch and get through today. Like that's wow. it. And like take care of the things that I can take care of. And that's it. I don't need to answer to anyone. I don't need to come up with any creative ideas. I don't need to like wow. keep the world spinning. Like I just need to worry about me and like what I'm eating and the way I'm feeling yeah. and how much I'm resting. That it was like a boot camp for wow. rest, like what she's saying. Um, wow. That I hope continues uh, and is really, yeah, made me a lot more understanding of my feelings yeah. and a lot better at embracing cringe Ooh. in the past sarcasm obviously was a huge avenue of my comedy still yeah. is but i think that also like created this wall between embracing any sincerity for me yeah. and this really just like that all of the memes i'm cringe but i'm free like i was like yes 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 that's wow. me that's me that's me um, just like really embracing the sincere parts of it and like the yeah. gratitude and those kind of feelings that can sometimes seem a little cheesy or overblown in like 
yeah modern pop psychology like speak but that shit works <laughs> it, does. Yeah, it does it literally does <laughs> like in the morning i started doing like i call it my serenity walk like talk about cringe yeah. and i walk no. I power walk in the suburbs and yes I, and i start with a mental gratitude i use yes. my arms and i and i start with a mental gratitude list and i just think about all the things i'm grateful for yes. and then i visualize the things i want it's just like focusing on what i have and what i'm grateful for and then visualizing whatever it is yep. like being a more present mom or like whatever piece of art I want to make or just getting better rest. It doesn't matter what yeah. it is, but just like spending a 10 minutes each day doing that. Yeah. It's because my brain was hardwired to worry, 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 yes. worry, worry, and only think about the worst things. Yep. And my inner critic was the, like running the show yes. basically. And so it's why I like for a while, like the beginning years of the internet, like none of the negative comments really got to me because I was like, man, if you guys could actually hear what I say to myself in my head, this is nothing this but what know. you guys, go ahead, try to say something about me that I haven't already said to myself a million oh. times. And that kind of being able to move that voice to the back yeah. and bring like a gratitude voice up front just shifts everything. Yeah. So it's cliche, but it works for me because I haven't, ever really thought like that before wow this was amazing Thank i you. love this it was really inspiring i'm all i tingled a lot through this i was <laughs> i know i got and I super hear, tingly like i feel like i said i just want to hear everything going on with you i can tell you there's a lot <laughs> let's have lunch and i'll tell you 100 percent. or come back on whatever yeah we can do it on or off camera i don't i love give about you <laughs> <laughs> that should be your tagline. We can do it on or off camera. I don't give a <laughs> shit. I don't give a <laughs> shit. Oh my God. Thank you it. so much for coming. Thank on. you for You're having amazing. me. So inspiring. Round of applause for Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. We did this it. This is great. Thank you.